Hello guys, welcome back, hope you're well. Today I'm going to be taking a look at this lens, it's the Fuji 18-55 f2.8 to f4 lens. So yeah, a few weeks ago, a few episodes back, I did a what's in my camera bag video, which I do every single year. In the comments section there was quite a few uh, comments regarding, you know, the lenses it was more centered around the lenses if you like the comments people were asking a lot of questions about the lenses so i thought it'd be great since i was still in lockdown here in the uk to uh, actually deep dive into my lenses so i'm gonna do a series of three different videos taking a look at the three lenses that i use for landscape photography so they are the 10 to 24 the 18 to 55 and the 50 to 140. so yeah today's video is the kit lens it's not a kit lens. Uh, it definitely is not a kit lens. It's marked down as one by some, but it is an absolutely brilliant lens. Today, I'm gonna to be uh, taking a look at it in depth for video and photography. Now, I've done some image quality tests for this lens. After having this lens for three years, I thought it was about time that I got round to it. And I was really, really surprised actually. And uh, it's actually produced some very, very interesting conclusions, some that I didn't know about. So yeah, stay tuned for that. So let's just run through the specs for this little bad boy. Now let me tell you, I have put this through some, yeah, <laughs> I've put it through its paces, let me tell you. It's been soaked, it's been covered in dust, it's been dropped, it's been in my bag for my wedding photography, my wedding videography, and also every single landscape trip I go on. So. You know, this has had three years of abuse and it's still going strong. The build quality is absolutely amazing. And I think you can only really tell um, about build quality when you've had a lens for a certain time. You know, it's, it's great, isn't it? When you first get a lens, you think, yeah, yeah, you know, it's build quality is good. But after three years, you really start to know whether it's good or not. And, and I can honestly tell you, it is really, really good. It's not weather sealed. And like I mentioned before, I've got this lens absolutely soaking and it seems to be able to withhold that quite well. So yeah, I mean, I don't advise getting it soaked, but it's, yeah, it's been in plenty of rainstorms and it's coped with it really well. I've always made sure I dry it out afterwards, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend getting it wet, but it's certainly coped with what I've thrown at it over the years. So uh, let's just quickly talk about the, uh, obviously it's a standard zoom, you know, we've got the 18 to 55, it's got a 58 millimeter filter thread on there as well. Um, it's got a variable aperture, so it starts at 2.8 when you're at 18 mil and then goes to F4 when you zoomed into 55 mil. So you've got that variable aperture. And that is why the aperture ring on here doesn't have the aperture markings like some of the Fuji lenses. It's because we don't really know where we're gonna be you know, when we're zooming through that zoom range. So obviously when we're at 55, we're at F4. So, but the, F, the aperture F-stop is displayed on the LCD screen. So you don't really have to worry. You know, you can find out where you are by looking at that. So we've got the optical image stabilization button on the side here which lets us turn off the stabilization and let me tell you this stabilization is really good on this lens and uh, yeah comes highly recommended um i've also got the uh, manual and automatic aperture button there so if you if you ever decide you want to shoot auto you can switch that over um, the focusing ring is lovely and smooth and it's really really precise and accurate especially if you choose to use a linear focusing which I highly recommend that you do you can change that settings in your uh, settings menu and that allows you to have more precise control over your uh, focusing the zoom is nice and smooth however I probably would say over the years mine is a little bit looser than it perhaps was when I first had it what I've noticed sometimes when I'm changing filters, especially the magnetic kind that I use, when, uh, when I'm taking the filter off, it'll perhaps you know, pull the zoom out. So that's something to uh, perhaps think about. But I mean, you know, this is three years down the line. It's not really a big issue, to be honest. Let's move on to take a look at the video specs. Let's talk about video. Now, this lens really does excel for video use. Um, I use it all of the time for video use. It's uh, really, really good. It's always in my wedding videography kit bag. Um, 
One of the reasons for that is it racks focus beautifully with a continuous autofocus. So if you choose continuous autofocus and uh, set up touch to focus on your touch screen, you can rack focus between two objects really, really well. It's the best lens I've ever used for that. It can rack focus between two objects better than I can do it manually. So that's why it's always in my wedding videography bag because just purely for that reason really. For the rest of the day I'm shooting with primes but if I need to do a detail shot where I need to rack focus between two objects this will come out and it does the job perfectly. You can uh, you can select in the menu for on the X-T3 for example how slow you want that transition to be as well. Now one thing I would say is the reason it's so good is because there's hardly any focus breathing on this lens at all. So compare that to say the Fuji uh, 35 f2 which is absolutely shocking for focus breathing i have to say and you'll see exactly what i mean i'll throw these two examples up on the screen right now and you can see the difference between the two and that's why this is so good for video use when you're rucking focus because you don't get that zooming effect you do with quite a lot of other lenses so in terms of the image you get out of this for video it's really really nice it's not too sharp and now i know that sounds a bit weird because we always want our lenses to be sharp but perhaps for video especially when you're filming people you don't really want it too sharp if you're shooting in 4k and this offers a little bit of softness and whether that's to do with the the crop factor when we're shooting in 4k it does crop in a little bit but it offers a really organic feel to the footage especially if you're shooting in a turner as well so for video use this lens is fantastic the IBIS is also very, very handy for video use. So take a look at these two um, samples here. At 55mm, you can see the difference between having optical image stabilisation turned on and turned off. That's on the X-T3, which doesn't have any IBIS, so you can really tell that that optical image stabilisation makes a big difference when you're shooting handheld with a camera that doesn't have in-body stabilisation. So, yeah. Great, great lens for video. It comes highly recommended for video use. Anyway, so let's take a look at this lens for photography. Let's see where it shines and where it doesn't shine for photography. Now, I I should have done this test when I first got the lens, but you know, <laughs> three years later, I got there eventually. I've done this test uh, with various different apertures. I've pitched it up against a couple of prime lenses. And like I mentioned before, a couple of my other zoom lenses as well to see how well it stacks up with image quality and uh, that is the most important thing really especially when we're taking a landscape photos so let's move this video inside and we'll really get stuck into uh, yeah these images and see where this lens shines here we go so photography let's talk about photography i could talk about photography all day anyway we've got Obviously, the 18 55 mm zoom range, so it covers a, a fantastic range, doesn't it? That, that standard zoom. I guess before we talk about image quality, which is probably the most important thing for photography, isn't it? I should perhaps talk about some of the other things, maybe autofocus. Now, I don't use autofocus for my landscape photography. I've always got the camera generally on a tripod, and I will you know, set my shot up, take my time, and manually focus where I need to focus. So autofocus isn't really a big deal for me. But in the past, I have used it at weddings when I needed a wider shot. Say, for example, um, a dance floor shot um, where my primes weren't wide enough. I've put this on and still got the 2.8 um, aperture, so quite wide, lets quite a lot of light in. But I have found, especially when we've got, you know, maybe lasers, lights, flickering lights, moving people, it has struggled in low light conditions to obtain focus. Now, I think, you know, a lot of lenses do as well. I don't think there's any surprise there. But, yeah, it probably does struggle a bit in low light. And overall, you know, it's not the quickest lens to focus. But, you know, um, it's not really a big deal for what I do. So it's never really bothered me that much. I'm not saying it's awful or anything like that. It's just probably not the fastest uh, autofocus lens you're ever going to use. Um, nice 
uh, wide aperture at f2.8 at the wide end so that's great you know if you want to do portraits that type of thing uh, 55 mil at f4 um, providing you're not too far away from your subject you can throw that backdrop really nice and separate your subject from the background so yeah even you know even f4 you can still throw your background quite nicely so that's not a problem um, yeah that's uh, pretty much it in terms of all of the other bits but we really want to dive into the image quality because I think that's what surprised me the most about this lens. Problem with uh, trying to show you things like this on YouTube is when I upload this into a video format and then it gets compressed in the YouTube uh, system. Things never look quite as good as uh, they do here when I'm looking at it on my editing monitor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all of these raw files in a folder for you to go and download for yourself. So if you fancy taking a look for yourselves, I highly recommend you jump over to my website. I'll leave a link in the description. If you, uh, if you fancy sign up for my newsletter, that would be amazing. And you can also grab these images and uh, yeah, See for yourself how, how you think this lens pitches up against the likes of the 10 to 24, the 50 to 140, and also some of these super sharp Viltrox lenses. Uh, this one's the 33. Actually, the 23 is filming me right now. So as you can see, we've got the uh, settings here. I've left the settings, the information at the top there, cause so you can see exactly where you are. You can, if you download these files, you'll be able to do the same thing. If you're in Lightroom, just press I on your keyboard and it will re rotate through those settings. This is going to help you see what settings and what lens is used for each of the images when you're looking at them. Otherwise, I've got to go through and write on each individual image and it'll just take forever. So by doing that, you know exactly your, your what, what shot it is and you can compare them. If you want to compare several images, um, make sure you're in the develop module and just go to the reference view um, let's get rid of this panel here. So, as you can see, the image on the right here is 18mm at f8. So, if I wanted to compare that with the f2.8 image, I can do. Now I can zoom into those. Now, what I've noticed when I've been looking at these images is a good point to look at was this leaf here on the right hand side, this particular leaf. Um, so let's compare these two shots at f2.8. We can clearly see that f8 is the uh, much, much sharper image. And that's to be expected, uh, to be honest. Generally, when we get into the middle of the aperture range, we start to see the lens sharpness become you know, at its optimum. So let's switch out our f2.8 image for an f11 image. So and this is what I found most surprising actually this lens seems to be sharper at f11 than it does at f8 now i found this very surprising and i wish i actually tested this out sooner because in my mind i always considered an APS-C lens to be sharper somewhere between f7.1 and f8 probably is the sweet spot but from my testing here i've actually found out that f11 is the sweet spot so i've always gravitated towards f8 with this lens actually on all of my lenses um thinking that probably that's about where you know it's at its optimum but yeah very very surprised if you take a look here and bear in mind that we're right on the edge of the uh, of the image here it's super super sharp and it, it is sharper than f8 as well and uh, even if we look in the center we'll still still see it's very, very similar in the center, to be honest, there isn't a lot of difference. So I think at 18 mil, the conclusion is that at F11, it's sharper than it is at F8. And if we, uh, if we change our reference view image here to the F16 image, we can clearly see it starts to soften up again. And you know, that's to be expected, all lenses soften up when you stop the aperture down and when they're wide open. It is what it is. But it's clear as daylight that this image is, for me, the sharpest at f11. And that's really, really surprising. 
Let's just go a bit further down. Now, like I said, if you download these images, there's heaps on there that you can do comparisons with. So before I got too much further, I wanted to test out how this performed at 23 mil. And the results were very, very similar, to be honest. They were better at f11 than they were at any other aperture. So again, quite consistent with that. Now, I was really keen to test this out um, with the Viltrox 23 f1.4 lens, which in the middle of its aperture range is super, super sharp. So as you can see here, when we've got the Viltrox and the 18 to 55 next to each other, we can clearly see how super, super sharp the 23mm Viltrox lens is. It is absolutely pin sharp. And we can see a little bit of softness here with the 18 to 55. But, so if we put the f11 image up side by side with the Viltrox image, we start to see it sharpen up quite a bit more. And actually, it's not a million miles away from the Viltrox now. And the Viltrox is a prime lens, you know, and it's one of the sharpest prime lenses I've ever used. It's, uh, it is no shadow of doubt. It is it's a fantastically sharp lens. It does have its other downfalls, but it's a fantastically sharp lens. And even in the center, when we're looking at the center of the lens, you know, both of these side by side, you can see all the little dust and hair particles that are all over this Polaroid camera. They're almost identical, I would say. Um, perhaps the Viltrox is just a touch, touch sharper, but it's so minimal. And, uh, you know, I think perhaps we see it over, it over here on the, on the green leaves, probably that it is just a fraction sharper, but, you know, we're talking about a kit zoom lens versus one of the sharpest prime lenses I've ever used, I think. So that's incredible. I did the same tests a bit further on as well with the 33mm Viltrox lens. And again, I uh, tested this out with... Uh, I'm at 34mm here, so a little bit of difference. Again, f11, f8 on the, uh, on the Viltrox you can see that it's not a million miles away. It's super, super close. So this this lens is keeping up with the prime lens at f11. Now I do need to point out that once we move it to f8, it softens up. Once we go up to f16, it softens up. But f11, it it is you know very, very similar, which is incredible, really. I have to say, it really is incredible. And um, one thing I should sort of mention as well, and you might see this if you look at these two images side by side, and, and I mentioned, you know, that the Viltrox, do, they do have some downfalls, and you can see, clearly see the, the difference in the colour there. So the Viltrox is a bit more of a magenta cast to it um, than the Fuji lenses do, and that's pretty, pretty much the same with all the Viltrox lenses as well. So here we've got the Viltrox 56mm f1.4 against the 18 to 55 at 55 mil. Now, again, we're at f11, so this is its sharpest. Now, this is where we start to see this uh, really uh, struggle, to be honest. I think it really does struggle once you get above 50 mil. And you can clearly see that on these leaves here. You can really see how much softer it is once we get up to the top end of the zoom range. But again, we are talking about pitching this up against the Viltrox, which is a prime lens. So, you know, I think we've got to give it a little bit of leeway. But let's see how it does against the Fuji 50 to 140 lens at the top end of the zoom range. Because I'd expect this to be way better at 50mm than this is. So let's take a look at those images and we'll see, uh, see how well it does. This is the 50 to 140 lens. Again, we're up on this uh, leaf here. I'm going to pick out that leaf and take a look at that and uh, yeah I think it's fair to say that the 50 to 140 lens is a fair bit sharper than the 18 to 55 and you know I was expecting that to be honest there's no surprises there the 50 to 140 lens between 50 and uh, 55 mil it is the stronger lens it's optically better it's sharper um, so I think I would be gravitating towards the 50 to 140 once I got around 50 mil. So I don't really, I don't need to go to 55 on this if I've got this in my bag as well. So that's something to think about. So let's take a look at the test that I did uh, when I had the image stabilization turned on and turned off. So uh, I'm going to zoom into this little plant a bit. 
Now, the one on the left is without the image stabilization, and the one on the right is with the image stabilization turned on. And I just want to see, I've heard from many different places that you should always turn your image stabilization off when you've got it locked down on the tripod. I don't think I've ever seen any evidence to suggest that it can make a difference, but I've heard it from so many different places and I've never really noticed it with anything that you know I've done in the past, but it is good practice to do it, I'm sure it is. But with the image stabilization turned on and turned off, the images are exactly the same. There is nothing to tell between the two, which I'm really pleased about actually, because so many times I forget to turn it off. But that being said, I would always recommend turning it off when you remember, because I think it's good practice to do that. Um, I go down to the other end of the zoom range and go down to 18 mil with the 18 to 55. And I test this against the 10 to 24 lens. So I've got the 10 to 24 lens on the right hand side and 18 mil on the 18 to 55 f11 again so i'm going to take a little look at these uh these leaves i think it's fair to say that the 10 to 24 is a little bit sharper in here than it is on the 18 to 55 what surprised me is that the center of the image is I think it's probably better on the 18 to 55 than it is the 10 to 24, which is quite strange. Another thing I noticed as well is the 10 to 24, there seems to be a little bit more distortion on the 10 to 24 lens, especially in the corners. The plant pots seem a little bit more stretched out than they do on the 18 to 55, which is, uh, yeah, quite interesting. I actually think the 18, the 18 mil, the 18 to 55 um, image looks better overall than it does on the 10 to 24 and that's surprising especially as you know the the 10 to 24 is you know 18 mils pretty much in the middle of its zoom range so let's take another, another little look a bit further up so this is 24 mil so this is pitched up against the 10 to 24 mil at 24 mil and 18 to 55 at 24 mil and um, let's take a little look again both of them are f11 and now actually we start to see that the 18 to 55 is sharper than the 10 to 24 and again perhaps you'd expect that because we're eating into the zoom range here with the 55 to 18 mil we're at, we're at um, 24 mil aren't we so we're not right at the end of its zoom range and with this one we're obviously right at the end of its zoom range so therefore it becomes a little bit softer and we can clearly see that can't we so again with the 10 to 24, this plant pot feels a little bit more stretched out than it does on the 18 to 55. I think we can perhaps see a little bit more distortion on the top of this. It's a bit more angled. Um, I think we can clearly see, actually, when we look at the numbers here on this lens, how much sharper the 18 to 55 is compared to the 10 to 24 at similar apertures or should I say at the same apertures but obviously end of its focal range getting more towards the middle of its focal range so super super interesting results for me personally and hopefully you found that interesting as well I mean I didn't know this lens was as good as it was at f11 that, that is a complete surprise to me. I always gravitated towards F8. And it makes me actually quite happy because from a landscape photography perspective, I would much prefer to shoot at F11 than F8 in nine times out of 10. It's gonna give me more depth of field. It's gonna ensure I've got more things in focus. And if it's sharper at F11, it's gonna be my go-to setting from now on when I've got that lens on the camera. So I think what I'll be doing is avoiding the very ends of the zoom range and making sure I've got these available to use when I when I when needed when I am getting towards the end there. But I have no hesitation whatsoever in using this lens for landscape photography. You can see how sharp it is, and uh, yeah, like I said, don't just take my word for it. Go and grab these images, get them on your PC, take a look at them for yourself then you can make your own mind up. 
So yeah, I hope you f found this video, you know, informative. I hope it helps in some way. I know uh, it's very, very difficult to, uh, you know, gather information about lenses. You really need to test them yourself as well. And I urge everybody to uh, test their lenses and don't wait for three years until you get around to testing them. Another thing I should perhaps mention is that not necessarily all lenses are going to be the same you know they've got stringent tests when they come out the factory but you know it's worth doing the tests yourself you know and if you find when you get a lens if you do some tests with it and you're not happy with it send it back and get another one i've done that before um so you know uh, don't don't be afraid if you're not happy with the sharpness to send it back and get another one and if that is the same then you can probably think that yeah you know that's how it should be but you really need to be able to compare it with something so yeah don't wait three years to test your lens that's the moral of today's video guys so guys that pretty much wraps up today's video thank you once again to everybody that supports this channel whether that's by my photography club and supporting me that way and getting involved there or through liking subscribing sharing and watching these videos your support is very very much appreciated and I never take it for granted. Anyway, guys, until next week, stay safe, take care, and I'll see you soon.